In this video, we're going to look at the hardest and most commonly failed driving theory test questions. So that way, you've got the hardest questions out of the way, and you've only got to focus on the easy questions that you're probably going to get right anyway. And the key thing to remember is that actually most of the theory test is really extremely easy. So you're usually presented with something along this lines. So if a signal light changes from green to amber as you approach an intersection, what should you do? And you're presented with three options that are clearly extremely dangerous and extremely stupid, and one which is obvious and safe. So if you look at all the answers, rule out the ones that are stupid, and just pick the one that is sensible. And for most of the theory tests, that is how you do it. So you've got continue through an intersection without slowing or stopping, which is dangerous and stupid. Speed up to clear the intersection as quickly as possible. Again, stupid. And lastly, at the bottom, sound your horn to warn pedestrians and other drivers that you do not intend to stop. So you've got three completely ridiculous answers. And by the process of elimination, you're left with one that isn't stupid, which is stop. If a stop cannot be made safely, proceed with caution. So that is a sensible, safe, common sense approach to take. And it's the right answer. I would suggest that if you're struggling with this question, brutally, you're probably too stupid to drive. And a lot of the theory test is like that. However, a minority of the theory test questions that we're going to focus on are a little bit more complicated. So we've got these two signs, and these are generally poorly understood and often mixed up. So we're going to get these ones straight so that when they come up, you're going to get the right answer, no problem. So the first one is two-way traffic crosses one-way road. So the best way to understand this is with a diagram. So you've got a one-way road running that way, so you might be driving along the one-way road. And this sign is going to warn you that there is two-way traffic crossing over that road. So you're gonna position your vehicle appropriately knowing what's coming ahead. And a very similar sign is this one with a very slightly different meaning. So this is two-way traffic ahead. So you're traveling along a one-way street and crossing over you is a two-way street. And so this is again a warning indicated by the red triangle that's gonna tell you that you've got to sort yourself out to be ready for that two-way street coming up ahead. Coming in at number three, we've got time gaps. You've got to know how long do you leave between your car and the car in front in terms of a time gap. And the question could give you options of one, two, three, four seconds, and you've got a one in four chance of getting it right, and most people will guess this. The cleverer people will know this nice little rhyme, which says only a fool breaks the two second rule. So the answer is two second. It doesn't matter if it's 30 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour, because the fact that it's time, it takes into account the different speeds. So always two second rule. And that's how you're going to answer this question. Moving on to space gaps. So instead of being asked in terms of time, you could be asked in terms of distance. And this one actually depends on the speed that you're traveling. And rather than wasting your time memorizing a whole load of distances, it's best just to remember a rule of thumb, which is that you leave one meter for every one mile an hour. So if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, you should be leaving 30 meters. And if you're traveling on a motorway at 70 miles an hour, you're going to leave 70 meters. Really simple, really easy to remember. So memorize those two rules and space gaps and time gaps are not going to be a problem. But you also have to remember that in poor conditions, those numbers are going to get bigger. So if it's icy or very wet, you're obviously going to adjust those appropriately and they adjust upwards. Moving on to look at stopping distances. And a question you could get is something like, what is the stopping distance in dry conditions when traveling at 60 miles an hour? So the stopping distance is how long it takes your car to come to a complete stop. And that includes the thinking distance and the braking distance. And this one's a little bit more complicated to remember, but again, you don't want to be wasting your time memorizing tables. So there is a pattern. It's not great, but it does really work. So you go up in tens on the speed. So you start at 20, which is the lowest speed you tend to get in speed limits outside of car parks, up to 70 miles an hour. So you're going up in tens. And then you've got to remember you start at two by multiplying, and then you go up in increments of a half. And you're allowed to give your answer in terms of imperial. So remembering it in these units is fine because it'll have that as an option. So you start at 20, go up in tens, multiply each one by two, going up in increments of a half. So two, two and a half, three, three and a half, and so on. And you should be able to recreate that from memory. So just start at 20 miles an hour, 
do the multiplications, you can draw out that entire table in your test and you'll get the answer right. So it doesn't matter whether they're asking about 30 miles an hour or 70, you're gonna get it right regardless. So moving on to number six, which is speed limits. And you may think, well, this shouldn't be on the hardest one. Speed limits is really easy. Well, it's not speed limits on a motorway or something that's common sense. You actually have to know the speed limits of wheelchairs and mobility scooters. It is in the syllabus. And the answer is eight miles an hour. That's for road-based ones. You don't need to know about uh, those that are restricted to pavements. But for those on the roads, eight miles per hour is the speed limit. And it could, in theory, be asked on your test. And when it has been, it's been done terribly. Moving on to number seven, you go in a skid in icy conditions. What do you do? And this next tip could potentially save your life because the answer is the complete opposite of what you think. And so I'm going to put up the answer and you need to think carefully about it before you instantly think that I'm wrong. The answer is you remove the brakes and you turn into the skid. So by braking hard, you're going to make things worse, especially if you don't have anti-lock brakes. And then turning into the skid is the weirdest bit, but you have to remember the back wheels is what's causing you to skid. So by turning into the skid, you're going to align your back wheels to get you out of it. Whereas if you do what's natural and you turn away from the way that you're skidding, the back wheels are going to go even further in the wrong direction and you're going to end up skidding even worse and perhaps, you know, completely rotate round. So the way to remember this is just to memorize that rule. And when you end up in a skid, hopefully it never happens, but if you do, this is what you do. Take the brakes off straight away, turn into the skid. So do the complete opposite of what you expect to do. And then it will actually work. Moving on to number eight, what is LPG? Nice, simple one to remember. Liquefied petroleum gas. And if you don't know what that is, it's what's found in those canisters. So just one of those things that can be transported on the roads that is dangerous. So drivers have to have an awareness of it. Coming in at number nine, what does a flashing amber light mean? So you've got a pelican crossing there and it's flashing amber. A lot of people don't know what that means. They just assume it's like get ready or the kind of simple stuff, but it has a slightly different meaning, which is to give way to pedestrians already on the crossing. So if someone has started to cross and it's flashing amber, you have to, and it is law, it's the same as a red light, you must stop and you must wait. If someone hasn't started st started crossing yet, you can cross the road on a flashing amber. However, you don't want to do it fast. You want to give them time so you can see that they're actually stopping. So you proceed with caution on a flashing amber, but if there's someone has stepped onto the crossing during a flashing amber, you must by law stop. So there's a slight distinction between how people understand amber and flashing amber in a pelican crossing. So remember this and you won't get muddled up with that. And finally, the last one at number 10 is police officer signals. So when it comes to hand signals, people tend to do really badly. The good news is half of the symbols roughly the signals rather are very simple and the other half are a little bit confusing. So the top row is stop. So these are the three different ways that a police officer can indicate to stop. And I've put down the directions so you can take some time to go through those. Whereas the police officer could be indicating to go and there's the other ones you have to remember. So I'm highlighting here this one and this one as the ones that you have to pay attention to. So obviously when a police officer has the palm of their hand pointing straight forward that is indicating stop all right so the flat palm forward is indicating stop except for when you've got a hand an arm outstretched stationary which is a way of saying stop to the traffic approaching from behind and the other one to remember is that when the police officer has their hand straight up like that and it looks like they're beckoning kind of forward so the idea of beckoning is, is the clue that it's a, a sing, signal to go, and that's from the side. So memorize those two that are highlighted, and then I would say the other ones are obvious what they probably mean. So hopefully by going through these hardest questions, the theory test is gonna be so much easier. So you're gonna come across the hard questions, nail them, and you're left with those silly, obvious questions. And finally, thank you very much for watching.